you've just landed inside Launch Street, the innovation podcast, where we interview top innovators out there shaking things up so you can innovate and differentiate and get further faster in this crazy cluttered world. And now, innovation thought leader and your super fly host, Tamara Kleinberg. Hey everyone, Tamara here. Super excited about today, and I have to tell you, I just shared this with Ash as well. 99% of the time, people send me books to read, and then I kind of decide, do I want to talk to this person? Do they have something of value to you, to our community? And then I got a hold of this book called Scaling Lean, and I read it, and I did the worksheets and everything else that went with it. I think the canvas, and I thought, oh my gosh, I have to talk to this guy. The community has to know about this book and what this guy is up to. So I'm super excited about today. I have Ash Moria with me, who is the author of Scaling Lean, Mastering the Key Metrics for Startup Growth, but there is more to him as well. He is also the author of Running Lean and the creator of the business modeling tool Lean Canvas. He regularly hosts sold-out workshops around the world. He serves as a mentor to several accelerators, including Techstars, Accelerate, Slingshot, he gets lectures at universities like MIT, Harvard, University of Texas, Austin. He serves on the advisory board on a number of startups. So I'm pretty sure this guy knows what he's talking about. So Ash, thank you so much. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be on. So let's start. Expand upon your background. Give people a little bit of the street cred, where you come from, and kind of what got you to this place of having this knowledge to write this book. Yeah, so I'll start off by saying that when I do get emails even today, the first book I wrote uh, in 2010, 2011 time frame, and I still get emails to this day saying, I wish I read your book five years ago. And I quickly <laughs> quit back, you know, me, me too, because I've made every mistake that I, that I talk about avoiding in this book. Uh, but really where I come from, I've been a practicing entrepreneur for over a decade built lots of products along the way. And like everyone on the call, all my ideas were surely awesome when they started out. But what I learned is that that wasn't enough. Um, so all those ideas, I would have loved for them to be super successful. Some some did well, but others didn't. And what bothered me wasn't so much the success, right? Because we all know startups are you know uncertain, lots of risk involved. Uh, but what bothered me is that I didn't really have a way of knowing which were the good ideas from the bad for a really long time. So I was taking a year and a half to two years going through ideas uh, one at a time. And so that's when I realized that something had to give. I, it was not so much every idea is going to work, but I needed to quickly know whether this was a good egg or a bad egg. So I began looking kind of introspectively first at myself um, to see what were some of the mistakes or things I could have done better. Um, and then I also stumbled into some works from others, people like Eric Ries and Steve Blank were talking about the Lean Startup and what became the Lean Startup. These are some of the early ideas. And so I thought, you know, they were kind of talking about similar problems I experienced. And so I joined in on the conversation, did my own kind of rigorous research on my products and then many other products along the way. And uh, that was how the first book got written and that's how the second book also got written. So I want to... Uh, back into something that you said that I think is so important because most of us, I think you're right as entrepreneurs, I mean, I failed a million times and had I only known what I was putting all this time and effort into wasn't right in some way, I probably would have just did a little bit. How did you figure out as you were doing all that and knowing how to test your ideas early and this kind of methodology you, you created, how did you realize you had a, a, a process that people, other people could use, that uh, really a methodology more than you know, luck, because sometimes we just, we get lucky with our successes or we get lucky figuring out our failures, but you've actually got a proven method. <laughs> well, so I, I, I don't want to oversell. So I would say it's definitely a, a methodology that helps you know quickly whether you're on the right track. I, I would say there's no guarantee of success. And that's just something I just, you know, I, I'm, I come from a technical background, so I try to be precise. Um, so a good methodology, in my opinion, can provide you that guidance or feedback, it's a framework with which you can test your ideas. But if you start with a bad idea, it wouldn't make it a good idea. So that, that's just something I'll say. Um, but one of the ways that, um, that yeah, I, I just started sharing. So I, I very early on realized that I clarify my own thinking through writing. 
and the best way to do it is publicly. So I had a blog for a number of years, which was with my previous company, but I reset it and started a new blog on the ideas that went into the first book and just started sharing them publicly. And they struck a, they struck a nerve because I think what I realized is that some of the problems that I was encountering were rather universal. Uh, over the last four or five years, I've traveled almost around the world and I found that while we may all look different, speak different languages as entrepreneurs, we all want the same thing, fear the same things, and often make the same kinds of mistakes. And one of the core ones that I, I was kind of driving in on or hitting the nail on was this idea of falling in love with our own solutions. And so as entrepreneurs, right. when we see the idea, we think we know what we have to build and we do everything in our power to get the funding or the team or the resources to go do that. And we then realize that we've built something nobody wants. And so for me, the fundamental mind shift was moving away from thinking of the solution as a product to the business model as a product. And that was the epiphany that, that, I, I, that, I, that transformed the way I approach new ideas. And I think sharing that also resonated with others. And that's why it became um, as successful as it did. Yeah, it is so, you, what you said is so dead on about, you know, I talk to dozens of entrepreneurs every week, and it's, it's amazing to me that we, we may layer it in different language, but we're struggling with much of the same things, but we're doing it in our little, you know, corner offices in our homes or in a basement somewhere, and we don't really realize that other people are struggling with the same thing. So let's go to scaling lean. Explain kind of high level what that blueprint is. Yeah, so maybe I'll, I'll set some context with running lean. So I, I was you know, so for me, the, trans the, the, the epiphany was realizing that you have to build a business model just uh, and not just a product. And so in that first book, I, it was really more about um, how do we really engage with customers? What conversations do we need to have? You can't simply ask them what their problems are or, or what we should build for you because oftentimes they don't know. It's like you going to the doctor's office and saying, here's my diagnosis, give me the medicine. And even customers can't do that. Um, so they don't quite know they can describe symptoms, but you have to figure out what the root causes are. So that's what the first book was about. Uh, the second book, Scaling Lean, was, is all about um, how do you measure success? So one of the challenges we run into when we talk to customers is we sometimes get a lot of qualitative answers. Uh, we may get some people say yes, some people say no. Um, if you go back to your stakeholders or go back to your team, it doesn't seem like you might have enough. So Scaling Lean is all about how do you really create a robust plan A, um, knowing that the plan is going to change and evolve and adapt along the way. So it's much like we traditionally would have done a business plan, but I find that business plans go overboard. It's too big a document. No one reads them. You don't get the the feedback you need from the people that you want uh, to get the feedback from. And so in Scaling Lean, there are other tools that we use, things, as you mentioned, the, the Lean Canvas, which is a one-page business modeling tool. Um, there are some other simple tools like a customer uh, traction model or a ca customer factory blueprint that you can use to kind of model out what this business needs to do for it to work. And then from there, you start taking the, the steps to validate that. So let me ask you about the build. I have many questions. Let me start with the building a model, not just a product. Can you give us some examples of that? Because I think in theory, I do see people struggle with not really understanding the difference. Yeah. So oftentimes, again, when when people think of product, they think of the the solution. That you know, it could be a piece of software, it could be a restaurant, it could be the thing that you are going to deliver value with. Um, a business model, and that's one aspect. So I'm not going to say that's not important. That's you know totally it has right. to work. So you have you have to, you have to build something that creates value. But the way that I define a business model, or the way we you know the community defines a business model, is it's a it's a story of how your company creates value, delivers value, and captures value back. And those three parts have to work in any business. So you have to have the solution, and that's how you would create the value, or you, that's how you would um, deliver the value, the creation of the value comes from the value proposition. So after your customers use your product, what happens to them? How is their life better? What progress have they made? Um, the more, the better you can articulate that, the, the, the easier it is to have a conversation with the customer. And then the capturing value part should be somewhat obvious. Is that I, The way I describe it is that if you, the difference between a hobby and a business is one makes money and one doesn't. 
And so there is no business in the business model without revenue. So you have to be able to capture some of that value back in the form of monetizable payment or some derivative currency like how Facebook takes our attention and data and then sells it in a, separate, in a third party market of advertisers. So you have to be able to articulate that. And so that would be the business model story. So from day one, and I see a lot of entrepreneurs fall into this trap, is they say, well, I'm just going to build this really awesome product first, and then the business will take care of itself. And I found that that isn't always, doesn't play out that way. You almost have to think through the business model story. Yes, there's going to be lots of uncertainties, but at least you need to be able to articulate on paper how the business model will come together and then validate that in steps. Because if it doesn't work on paper, it's going to be harder for it to work out in the real world. Right. So do you think then that without the business model, there's also no vision or are those things separate? Um, I, I would say the vision can be, it's, 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 a, bigger, um, it's a bigger why. So oftentimes the, the vision is, is more, it's a deeper why question I find. So the way that we, we, we approach the business model is, again, using this one-page business modeling tool, and it's like a one-page business plan. So it's not writing a 60-page document. Um, you take the lean canvas, there are a few boxes you have to fill out. So things like who is your customer, what problems would you be solving for them, how would you solve it, so what solution would you build, how would you, what channels would you use to get to them, um, you know, how would you make money. So you can, you can fill out these boxes, and it, with practice it takes 20 to 30 minutes to do. Um, and after I've had that, what it does is exposes a number of maybe weaknesses in the idea or risks in the idea, which you have to tackle first. And so that's the point of that exercise. But where the vision comes in is often when I'll be talking to someone who has created one of these canvases, I start asking them, you know, why this idea or why this customer, why this problem? And typically then their kind of deeper kind of reasons come out. And sometimes it's just that, oh, they, they see an opportunity in the market, an unmet need, and they just want to go and capitalize on it. But oftentimes you'll find people have deeper whys, and that's where it, the beginnings of the vision and the mission kind of fall out uh, you know, from that conversation. So I'm, close, I'm so glad that you said that it exposes weaknesses because I have to. And, you know, actually this is our first time talking, but I, I, all my cards are always on the table. And I did the Lean Canvas, and I would have considered myself very clear on my business, who I served, the many I thought – and then I did the canvas, and you said, what, 30, 60 minutes if you're kind of, you know, good at it and fast. I stared at it for a couple of hours on some of the questions. I was so embarrassed. I was like, oh, my God, I'm not, don't know how to, I don't know how to articulate that concisely and clearly was my challenge. And I did have to go back and figure out a few things and rework it. And I just, I, it was in my head unclear, but it wasn't, it wasn't being articulated in a clear way. And I think that the lean canvas does a really good job of, forcing you in its simplicity to, and it's one page, because I don't believe in long business plans either. And that's probably, you know, a whole nother conversation we could go down. Just, they're just not, you got to test it in the marketplace too, in my opinion. But and yeah. spending all your time on a long business plan just doesn't allow you that. It's never perfect on paper. But your Lean Canvas tool made things crystal clear in a way that I hadn't had before. And I'm sure you find that from other entrepreneurs too. And I think part of that is it's the conciseness of it. Yes, and I, I think for me that was a bit surprising. I, I thought this was a simple tool, um, but I think the power <laughs> is in its simplicity. Um, so I, just as you're describing, you know, you put it in, so I, I put this in front of some of the teams I work with in workshop settings, and I put this one pager in front of them and say, you know, you've got 20, 30 minutes, fill it out, and here's a timer, go. Um, and so for me, I'm not looking oh, for God. perfection. And so we, we, and we even time box it because – before that, all these entrepreneurs would say their idea is crystal clear in their mind. They know exactly what they need to get done. But when they, when a 30-minute timer is off, like you're describing, a lot of boxes are still empty, and there are a lot of I don't yeah. knows. And that is very healthy because at least now you know what you need to go figure out. Um, so for me, it was not about getting all the boxes filled, but having people go through that exercise in that time box setting. Because if you can articulate those things you know, in 30 minutes, you, you sometimes have to do this in 30 seconds in front of a, you know, not the whole thing, but you have to get to the point um, in a few minutes if you were talking to an investor or you were talking even to a customer. You don't have hours to figure this stuff out. Um, that's right. So that's just that's practice. Right. So for me, I, I start with the 30 minutes. It exposes the weaknesses, and then we talk about it, and then we'll 
you know, provide places you can go get answers or some maybe some exercise you can do to get better at filling some of the boxes. And then you can go back at it, of course. And so you go back and by the time you're done with the first pass, sometimes we do a half day just to get the canvas to a nice setting, uh, a nice starting point. But even then, if you think about it, all those things are guesses. You know, I, I don't right. know all the right answers because I don't have a magic eight ball. If I did, I wouldn't be giving it away. I'd be, you know, using it for my own <laughs> businesses. Um, so again, those exercises are just to get best guesses. So even then, you have to get outside and then start to test them from high risk to low risk and then come back and you change it. So what I found is that in the first, you know, one, two, three weeks of this exercise, of this, of the building of the canvas, there's going to be lots of crashing. You're going to come back and say, this was the wrong customer segment. I'm going to go after this one instead, or this problem didn't really resonate with them. So I'm going to go after different problems. And so it's, a, it's an iterative process, and that's what the whole methodology is really about. Yeah, it's good. I mean, I, I, to the community out there, I highly recommend that you buy this book, you get access to the Lean Cam Canvas, and you try it out. It exposed where I was unclear, but I think that what that led to was actionable things, which is where I had cracks in other areas of my business because of that. So now I could go back and say, oh, that's not working because I'm unclear on this one segment. So it really does not just lead to let's perfect it on paper, but how does that really translate in your entrepreneurial business? Let's let's dig into some concepts in the Scaling Lean book itself. I want to specifically talk about traction. So can you define what traction is and why that's important? Yeah, so I go through a, a process of – I'll just give the definition. So I, I try to explain, but I'll, I'll set some context to say that a lot of people use that term but often use it very loosely. Um, so traction yeah. can just mean good things happening, you know, the curve, hockey stick curve effects, you know, things are going up and to the right. Um, and so I try to talk about what traction isn't. So traction always has to measure some customer behavior that we can use to capture or, or measure monetizable value in the business. So for me, traction is the rate at which a business captures monetizable value from its customers. And so some of the examples I give in the book is that if you look at Starbucks, for instance, yes, they sell coffee, but that is after the fact. So if you go to Starbucks, what they learned early on is that people came there for the experience. And this was an ac right. accidental discovery. Now it's obvious. But they realized that they weren't just selling coffee, they were selling an experience. And so time that people were spending in the store was actually that evidence of future money being spent. So if somebody came in and sat on the sofa and then they, they had their friends, they would pretty much get up at some point and buy coffee and buy other things, buy food. Now Starbucks has wine and, and beer right, in some locations. And so they're extending that. Um, so that would be a way that you think of traction, not so much what is the revenue transaction event, but rather what are some of those customer behaviors that cause that to happen. Um, similarly, if we go to Facebook, I was giving the example early on of kind of different roles. Uh, we have users there like you and I who would use Facebook and we create this asset we, with our data, with our right. attention. Um, and that asset is what is an, is an indicator of traction and Facebook will use that to then sell to advertisers and, uh, and, and, and make, their, make their business work. So do you think that with traction that, uh, and this is what I found fascinating about it when I read it, it, it felt like I was maybe confusing um, good st metrics like subscribers and likes and views and number of time my phone rings, you know, that I was almost confusing that with what, what really I should actually be be measuring or be looking at. Is that is that a fair thing to say that yeah. sometimes we confuse those two? Well so so that's a great point and maybe I'll 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 touch on that. So I feel like we have gone from a point where it was hard to measure anything. It was you had to invest a lot in measuring things to where now, especially if you're online, we can measure almost everything about what's happening on the site, you know, there's people liking us, how much time are they spending to where we have gone, you know, from an information overload of data. And I find more and more teams, and we were in that boat as well, as we would just start measuring everything and not get clear, but actually get more lost. Um, so in this book, I, I do start from zero. So I say the first thing you have to do is figure out what is that one metric for your business that you need to measure. And if that number is going up and to the right, uh, you can go to your stakeholders, you can go to your team, and everyone agrees progress is being made. 
So in the, in the uh, Facebook example, if the number of active users is going up, then that's a leading indicator that the advertisers will naturally you know, pay, will monetize more. And so that's what Facebook focuses on primarily. Um, if we go to a marketplace model like an Airbnb or, or Uber, there in Airbnb's case, it is the number of hotel bookings. It's not the number of listings or the number of people looking. It's how many hotels are we booking every single night. If that number is going up and to the right, then the business is making progress. So that would be, if I use a journey metaphor, that would be like figuring out what is the mileage count. Are we moving in the right direction? Are we getting closer to our goal? But to your point, there are still other inputs that go into the traction metrics. So what makes traction actually come true? Um, this is where things like you know, signups and things like retention, things like the referrals that you get from your business matter. And so in the book, I also describe five sub-metrics. So these are the customer factory blueprint metrics that make up traction that you should also be measuring because that helps you figure out where things might be falling apart. So if you're not getting enough signups, then you're not going to get the traction metric to work. So you may have to fix that first. Mm -hmm. But if you, at some point, if you get too many signups and your product is bad, that's not going to help either because all those people will leave right away. So you then have to fix that next. And so it's, almost like thinking of a funnel, but it's a bit more complex than a funnel. Um, one of the things that I, I guess one, one of the things that funnels lend, lend you into thinking is this idea of linear. We just have to get people from the top and squeeze them to the bottom. And then we get revenue out, you know, coming out of the bottom. And what I find is that it's a lot more complex. You're going to find these system effects where you might fix one area. You might make your product simple, you know, very engaging to use. But if you make it too engaging, people actually get so much value that they don't feel like they need to pay you. Um, so it's not as simple as just fixing every part of the funnel. You kind of have to think of it as a set of, 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 uh, of blocks that connect and, and actually in, are interdependent on each other. Hmm. I, you know, if, for those of you who are going to be listening to this on there, I would really pay attention to this concept of traction and what you're measuring. I do find a lot of people are measuring things that are I don't want to say they're fluffy. I think to your point, they're probably a step ahead, but they're not actually the way you're defining it, measurements of growth. And this made me really think about what I was measure, measuring. I mean, I, I was measuring subscribers and that was going up and I was happy, but in reality, that was a pre-measurement to what I should have, should be measuring instead, yeah. which is the true you know, sense of growth. But I was stuck in the, oh, I have to measure subscribers and likes because that tells you something, even though phew, I'm not even sure what it told me, but that's what I thought. <laughs> Yes. Yes, and I would say that that's that's almost like like if we use this idea of a factory metaphor, the, the the subscribers would be like you getting the raw materials, but you still have to turn them into customers, and so those are the right sub steps you have to measure. And also, I would also just caution that sometimes when we things like likes and it's very easy to fall into what we call the vanity metrics trap, where we yeah. just measure if these numbers are going up on an aggregate basis, like I put a post and I get likes and every every time I'm getting more and more likes, that gives us the impression that good things are happening, but you still have to measure those other metrics to see are they indeed converting. Because again, as I said, no business in your business model without kind of revenue. And so you have to get people all the way to the other end as well. Yeah, I, I think that's a really important important. Uh, Sticking point as well as thing that we need to pay attention as entrepreneurs, especially because we do need to measure progress. We don't have the bandwidth to wait a year to see if things are working. We have to continually. Me I'm a big fan of measuring as much as we can, but not being inundated with too much data. Um, you talked a little bit about derivative currency. You know, aside from Facebook, which I think is you know a great kind of example we all get. Are there entrepreneurial models that? fit that. And the reason I'm asking is it seems like so many people nowadays are trading on intellectual property and ideas. Does that fit into that, that business model versus a product or a, a storefront or a you know, consulting service? Yeah, it, it can. I mean, so some of the other examples that easily fit in here, I mean, so, it's, so I would say it, it applies in every situation where, you're, where your users are not your customers. So in the coffee shop example, you go into Starbucks and you decide to buy something. So you are the buyer and the consumer of the product. Uh, but whenever you've got that, that multi-sided market, you're going to find typically a derivative currency. And so it could be user-generated content. It could be that you are, if you look at, um, you know, as you said, IP, maybe there are people that are, are contributing IP. If you look at open source to some extent, there's IP being contributed by the community and then someone else is monetizing it. 
Um, that could be an example in in enterprise settings when a buyer, maybe the CIO, CEO buys uh, a product for the employees to be more productive with, there's a derivative currency as well. So they are the employees or the users, but the buyer is not buying necessarily the product for themselves. They're buying it so it creates productivity. So productivity is that, deri- that, that, that derivative currency. Um, so yeah, so that's it. how I would think of it. Anytime you've got these multi-actors, there's typically something and it's important and, and it's a key point because if you only think of just the user side or just the customer side, then you kind of may not have right, the right alignment. So there's always a I quid pro quo. I, even if you are giving away a product for free, I often say there is no such thing as a free user. They're always paying something back to you. And what they're paying back with is that derivative mm-hmm. currency. So with Facebook, it was that attention data. With others, it could be their added productivity to the business. Um, they could be the IP. They could be all kinds of things, user, user-generated content, other other types of things. Mm, that's so interesting. So in the essence of time, I want to take us out of the book and kind of go a little bit high level, although I, I could ask you, I've got a whole list that I'm taking notes. This is a little bit selfish interview <laughs> on my part. What are some of the biggest pitfalls you think entrepreneurs need to avoid or they, that you see people make over and over again? Yeah, so I so when I first started out, my personal mantra was life's too short to build something nobody wants. And that goes back to the original <laughs> problem that. Yeah, of just things taking you know way too long and we don't get younger. So with time, we just have to get more efficient. Um, so that was my initial inspiration. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, but my, my new thing that I've, I've been using a lot and uh, I think it's just so critical is this tagline of love the problem, not your solution. And it may sound very obvious, but I find that this entrepreneurial bias for the solution rears its head in many, many different forms and in many different ways throughout the process. So when you're first starting out, we talked about how you may fall in love with the idea and you fail to see all these other parts in that canvas. So starting with some a tool like the canvas or having a conversation where you more holistically look at the business model allows you to at least have appreciation for those other parts. So that's one way to, to kind of deflect that. But even when we start getting customers, I find that we often forget that customers don't know the answers either. And they often will ask for things, feature requests, and those are still solutions disguised as problems. And that's been my experience. So they'll ask for you to build something and when you build it, you'll realize that they don't use it because it didn't really solve the core problem. So there, too, you have to go deeper. If you just listen to customers, very quickly you build things that not enough people want, even they may not want it. So uh, Steve Jobs said it well when, it, when he said it's not the customer's job to know what they want. That's really <laughs> our job. So, so there's a whole process to uncovering that. And uh, so, so that's what I've been, been, I've been summarizing really my work of five years just with that love the problem, not your solution. And of course, a lot of how and how to do it and the pitfalls to avoid and how to recognize that you are being fed a solution and not a problem. But to me, I think that is the most critical kind of secret to all of this is if you can uncover real problems worth solving, it's easier to then build amazing products. So the, the, the analogy I often use is that a solution is like a key um, without a door. So you built this key, but you don't know what door it's going to open. If you can identify the door first then and do it in reverse, then we actually build keys that take us places. And that's, that's the way to kind of think of that. I love what you're saying. And I just want the people listening to take a pause, uh, particularly on the part of listening to the customer and, you know, which is so important on one hand, on the other hand, to your point, they don't always know what they want. And can you build something not only that they want, but they're willing to open up their wallets for, because those can be two very yep. different things too. You know, oftentimes Absolutely. they have a problem, but it's not worth the payment to fix it, whatever it is. Yep. So that, and that's been a lesson I've learned, you know, the hard way. And I will tell you, I spent way too many years doing, uh, launching new products for Fortune 500 in the consumer goods space. And I used to hate having to do focus groups because I found that customers, the people in the room, while very well-intentioned, were a, I don't want to call them liars, they were liars, but how they presented their problem, their vision of themselves is not, never quite matches reality. We all have a little bit of cloud when it comes to that. And the way the customers would talk about it was really yesterday's problems. And we're trying to launch something a year from now. So you, know, you have to like keep in mind the time frame of what, how, how we think and how we're articulating our problems. It's what happened yesterday, not what we could be doing tomorrow. 
Absolutely. Yep. So I want to talk about the flip side for a second, because we always talk about the things to avoid. Um, give us an example of scaling lean done right. Scaling lean done right. So I would I would say um, it it would be say so so, you, so if you have an idea, you would try to deconstruct it into those component pieces. So use a tool like the canvas, break it apart, um, and then identify what is the riskiest part. So it's like the playing the game of Jenga, which we all all know what that is. Um, you're yeah. trying to knock out all the, the risky parts in your idea first. And it's counterintuitive because we don't want to go poking, looking for problems, but that's what the entrepreneurial mindset requires. Um, even lots of, I, I've gotten interviewed a lot of very successful entrepreneurs and I found that some of the best ones are actually very risk averse. They actually look to remove all the risk out of their business as quickly as possible so that then they actually it's smooth, smoother sailing for them. Um, so that would be the, that, a critical mindset to develop is look at the, uh, you know, and that's why the one pager is helpful. You can look at it in one, in one whole kind of uh, uh, glance and identify where might be some of those pitfalls, those risks. And that's what we start working on first. Um, and so that requires sometimes working with advisors, people with more experience or working with your team to identify them. Um, and then, instituting just this mindset of, you know, we it's not about opinions, but facts. So we all have beliefs. Uh, we all think we know what's right for the product. But ultimately, what matters is what customers do, not what they say, but what they do. And so you have to build, develop that mindset right. of what I call an experimentation culture. So we, we launch things with this mindset of let's measure. So you have to build something, you have to measure whether it works or not. And from that, you're going to get learning. So if it works, you double down on it. If it doesn't work, you get to the whys. And then you just rinse and repeat. And so that, to me, is, is fundamentally what scaling lean, running lean, done right would look like. You know, you've said easily three times, if not more, about not falling in love with your solution. So if you're out there with your baby that you're afraid that anyone's going to call ugly, which is what we do as entrepreneurs, we're so like, God forbid, somebody doesn't like what we're doing you got to take a step back and think about, am I just too personally attached to whatever idea I think I, I've created? Because to your point, Ash, it really is about the business model and it's about the what you're delivering out there and the how is going to change over time. Yes, that's right. All right, so Ash, here's the personal question. What would people be surprised to learn about you? Oftentimes I think... Uh, well, people are often surprised, maybe two things. One is where I grew up. So I, I grew up in, in Africa. I've been living in, in the U.S. For, for a long time. So when they see me, that's something they don't often, you know, get right off the bat. So I grew I'm up surprised. in Nigeria, born, yeah, born to Indian parents. Um, but I came here for, you know, university and have been here ever since. Um, so that's probably one. And then the other thing is I do a lot of speaking now and people are, surprised when they hear that I used to be terrified of public speaking and uh, would run away from those types of things. Um, but I do it so much. And I find that it's really, once you find something worth, worth talking about and sharing, it kind of gives you these superpowers and you don't feel as, as timid anymore. So I used to run away from things. And that was something more my, my mom more than anyone is still surprised that I, I go around, <laughs> you know, traveling around the world and giving these talks. Um, to large audiences, which is something that I, I would have never thought I would do in my earlier years as well. That is great. But you're so right. If you have something you love, you're willing to put that extra effort in and overcome whatever fear. But it's all about having what you love. But I would have loved to see you before and after when you, how you used to be and how you are now, because you're very articulate now. That would have been kind of fun. So I'm sure your mom is very proud. Ash, where would you like them to go to buy your book, Access the Canvas? Yeah, so I, we put I, we put everything on um, at leanstack.com, L-E-A-N-S-T-A-C-K.com, and that's where you can find uh, links to my book, my blog. Lots of the writings are there, so you can you know, try before you buy. You know, whatever whatever you want to do, uh, we put a lot of content out there, some tools as well. So feel free to check it out. Excellent, Ash. Thank you so much. This was incredibly insightful, and I've I've got a page full of notes of stuff I need to think about from this interview. Thanks so much. 
Thanks for hanging out with us inside Launch Street. When you're ready to take your game to the next level, join the thousands of others that are upping their innovation edge on go to launchstreet.com, the top online education resource and community platform for innovators looking to use innovation to get measurable results. Go to launchstreet.com.